Okay, I'm one of the three team leads for this study. The other two are Ryan Park and Alfred McEwen. Um, so this morning we have the short course, which is sort of the kickoff for the whole study. Um, and this is a four lecture course to kind of get you up to speed on the basics of different facets of tidal heating. So the four talks are designed to address um, four different approaches to tidal heating, the orbital side, the interior side, the microscopic property side, and the geological activity. Uh, so the first talk that we have is by uh, Professor Francis Nimmo. So Francis is a professor in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at UC Santa Cruz. Um, he's been involved in several missions that are relevant to this study, including the Grail mission, Cassini mission, and is a team member on several instruments on the Europa Clipper mission. Uh, and he's done extensive work on tidal heating and geological activity on several solar system bodies. Uh, so the title of his talk is Geophysics and Interior Processes of Rocky and Icy Bodies. Okay, thanks, Catherine. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and take you fairly fast through a whole series of topics that hopefully the next speakers will go through in more detail. Um, but do feel free to stop and ask questions if there's something you don't understand. Uh, it makes it more entertaining to have a kind of conversation. So um, I'll start briefly with internal structure and rheology, which Christine McCarthy will talk about more. I'll spend the m bulk of my talk talking about tides and tidal response and tidal heating, and Dave and Isamu will treat with that in more detail. And then I'll talk a little about thermal orbital evolution and actually measuring heat flow. So to begin with internal structures, this is what we think the insides of silicate bodies look like in the solar system. So there's Mercury, Venus, Earth, the Moon, Mars, and then Io. Uh, the Earth is the only one for which we know there's an inner core. Also notice that Io and the Moon have about the same size, but the Moon has a smaller inner core, a smaller core, probably because of the special way it formed. And then similarly for Outer solar system moons, this is just a selection of the internal structures. You can see that they're more complicated because they tend to have an icy layer on top of the silicate and metal interiors. And the ice typically consists of low pressure, low density ice one, often an ocean, and then higher pressure ice phases, and then the silicates. Ganymede is the only one that we know has a separate core because it generates its own magnetic field. And the oceans, in most cases, have been detected by magnetic induction techniques. So the bulk structure of all these bodies, sometimes you can use seismology. But very often, the only way you can get at the internal structure is through looking at the shape and the gravity. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But the long-term shape of the body over hundreds of millions of years is controlled by this thing called the secular love number or the fluid no love number. And that just tells you how deformable it is, because these planets are being deformed by rotation and possibly by, uh, by tides. And the fluid love number depends on the density distribution. And so if you can measure the fluid love number, it turns out that gives you the moment of inertia. And so as long as the body behaves like a fluid, you can use this magic darwin rado approximation to go from a measurement of the distortion or the gravity to the moment of inertia. And so these two bodies have the same bulk density, but because they have different distributions of mass inside them, they're differently distorted. And so depending on how distorted they are, you can differentiate between these two cases, as long as it's behaving like a fluid. For something the size of the Earth, that's fine. For something as small as Mars, that's not a good assumption. And so this works well for some bodies, but it doesn't work well for all bodies. The other thing I wanted to mention very briefly is rheology, which is how materials respond to applied stresses. And the really important here is that some of the properties, like the rigidity, the resistance to shear, depend on frequency. And so different bodies experience tidal forcings at different periods. And so it means that the tidal period matters in trying to figure out what the response should be. And so just to illustrate that, here are a couple of plots from Fowle and Jackson. And what I'm showing is the shear modulus, the rigidity, 
and then the phase lag of the material, its olivine polycrystals, as a function of period. And so at high frequencies, at short periods, you get this sort of asymptotic behavior. But then as you go to longer and longer periods, the material becomes less and less rigid. And so because tidal periods are typically, you know, 10 to the 3 or 10 to the 4, four seconds, the effect of the period can be large. Also notice that the different lines here are different temperatures. And so as you'd expect, at high temperatures, you get this weakening even at relatively short periods, whereas at low temperatures, the weakening doesn't kick in until much longer periods. And you can see this effect of the period both in the rigidity and in the phase lag. Real materials don't respond instantaneously, and that phase delay increases with increasing period. And so I'm sure Christine McCarthy will talk about this a lot more, but material properties are frequency dependent. Oh, yeah. And if you in include melt or water, that makes things much more complicated. And I don't think we really understand how that works yet. OK, let me now talk about tides. So the basic picture is that you have a satellite, say, sitting next to a massive body. And because the satellite has some finite radius, then the material on this side of the satellite experiences a different acceleration than material on that side of the satellite. And so it gets distorted. Right? That's what it develops a tidal bulge. Furthermore, if the satellite is not in a circular orbit, if the orbit is eccentric, then the bulge changes. The bulge gets bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller over the course of a single orbit. And if there's any kind of friction in the system, then that mechanical work, some of it will get converted into thermal energy. And so this is why synchronous satellites in eccentric orbits can experience tidal heating. So you get this time-varying distortion, and you can get heating as a result. And I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. So the amplitude of this tidal response is what the love numbers describe. Here is a picture of love, a splendid Edwardian gentleman. Look at that moustache. Um, and so the body gets distorted. And so you need something to describe how its shape changes. And because the distortion involves a change in the distribution of the mass, it also alters the gravity field. And a large K2 or a large H2 just means that the body is responding a lot to the applied tidal potential. In practice, we usually measure K2 rather than H2 just because K2 is something that you can measure with an orbiting spacecraft. If you orbit it, you can sense the periodic change in the gravity and work out what K2 is. Although if you can also measure H2 as well as K2, that actually gives you additional information that you don't just get from K2 alone. This is something that Europa Clipper is thinking about very hard. So if you had a uniform body with no strength, then these are the biggest they can be. H2 is 2.5 and K2 is 1.5. But real bodies tend to have mass concentrated towards the center. And they also tend to have rigidity that's with resisting the tidal stresses. And so both rigidity and concentrations of mass towards the center make those love numbers smaller. But remember that ri the rigidity that we're talking about depends on what kind of forcing frequency. And so that's why the very long-term love number, the fluid love number, is different from the short period tidal love number. And so a body, if you deform it at long periods, will tend to have a larger love number than if you take the same body and you deform it more rapidly. And so that's why the tidal love numbers, the love number at the tidal frequencies, is going to be smaller than the long term or the fluid love numbers in general. So you've got to be really careful. People talk about love numbers. Sometimes they mean fluid love numbers. Sometimes they mean tidal love numbers, and it's easy to get confused. So one of the really useful things about love numbers is that they're very sensitive to the presence of liquid. And so for instance, if you want Europa Clipper to confirm the presence of an ocean, one way to look for is to try and measure the love number. Because if you put a liquid layer near to the surface, that decouples the near surface from the interior. And so the near surface can deform a lot more. Uh, 
Carver Beerson, who's one of my grad students right there, basically made the same argument for IO, that if IO is at least partly solid throughout, then it won't deform very much. But if you put a fully liquid magma ocean somewhere near the surface, then the deformation will go way up. And so this is a big effect, that instead of having a K2 of 0.1, you might have a K2 of 0.5. And so looking for near-surface liquid layers is one of the things that measuring the love number is very good for. Another example is Mars. This is the effect of the liquid layer known as the core. And what I'm plotting here is the K2 love number as a function of the core radius. And what you can see, as you might expect, is that as you make the core bigger, your love number goes up. And that's just because you're taking rigid mantle material and you're replacing it with liquid that has no rigidity. And so as you make the core bigger, the tidal response increases. But you have a problem, which is that you don't know how rigid the mantle is. And so if you make your mantle more rigid, that counteracts the effect of the core. And so that's what I'm showing here. This is, these are two estimates of the Martian mantle rigidity. And you can see that if you make the mantle weaker, you get a bigger tidal response too, which is what you'd expect. And so there's this trade-off between how big you make the core and how rigid you make the mantle. And with a little luck, insight will help us break this, this trade-off. So far, I've talked about the amplitude of the tidal response. What I want to talk about next is the phase of the tidal response. And um, what happens is that real materials don't respond instantaneously to some kind of applied stress, that there's a lag. And the way that the lag expresses itself is, let's say this is your satellite. Here's your primary. Um, let's make this the primary and that the satellite. So, as long as the, this body is outside the synchronous point, then it's actually moving slowly, slower than the, this one is rotating. And so what happens is that the tidal bulge actually gets dragged ahead of where the satellite is in the sky. And so if you think about the torques that result from that, what this does is it tends to spin the planet down. The torques are opposing the rotation. It also acts to push the satellite further out. And if you have a phase lag, then that's how you get tidal heating. So the phase lag is extremely important. And again, it's going to depend on the material properties and mechanical properties of the body. So the existence of this phase lag, it spins the primary down, it pushes the satellite out, and it can create tidal heating. And one of the ways in which you characterize this, this phase lag is by the dissipation factor Q. And so Q goes as 1 over the phase lag. And so high Q means low dissipation. Low Q means high dissipation. High Q means a small phase lag. And so that's just the way that it tends to be measured. And the way to think about Q is that it controls the rate at which everything is happening. If Q is very large, that means there's very little, little dissipation. And so everything happens very slowly. So Q is the way that you measure the phase lag between the applied potential and the response. And so by now, we actually have a fairly good list of measurements of these properties. So we know the K2 for a bunch of the inner solar system objects. And we actually also have a, a K2 measurement for Titan. This is still a bit uncertain. But Titan is clearly surprisingly deformable. We don't have a K2 for IO, but what we do have is a K2 on Q. And so if you guess at what K2 is, you can derive Q or vice versa. Um, we don't know quite as many Qs, but for instance, the Earth is perhaps surprisingly not very dissipative compared to, say, the Moon and even Mars. And these measurements are derived by a variety of techniques, but the K2s essentially all come from some kind of gravity measurement. So we know a fair amount about the tidal response of objects at this point. So let me summarize. 
To describe the tidal response, you need to describe the amplitude, which is given by K2 and H2, and also the phase. Some people just make K2 and H2 complex, and then the phase and the amplitude are both included in, in a complex variable. And these quantities depend on the rigidity and the density structure of the object, but they also depend on the frequency that you're talking about. If you have liquid layers, like a subsurface ocean on Europa, that increases the amplitude. Um, and so basically, if you can measure the tidal response, you can use that to infer the internal structure or something about the internal structure. One other point that I found useful is that very often when you're thinking about tides, it helps to put yourself on the satellite surface. And so, for instance, if you're thinking about Europa tides, put yourself on Europa and you watch Jupiter move backwards and forwards in a little ellipse overhead. And it's just, that's very often an easier way to think about the problem. Let me talk about tidal heating. So I think this is the one equation that I have in this talk. And that gives you the tidal heating rate. And so it depends on the amplitude and the phase. And it depends on a bunch of constants that you know. N is the mean motion, R is the radius, G is the gravitational constant. And then it depends on the eccentricity and the obliquity of the satellite. This is for a synchronous satellite. And the obliquity is just, is it tilted with respect to its orbital plane? So because the heating rate depends on K2 on Q, that means that it depends on the internal structure. And so for instance, if you took a purely elastic body that had an infinite Q, you'd actually get no heating at all, irrespective of what the the orbit looked like. This is what um, a simple calculation of how tidal heating should work looks like. So this is the tidal heating as a function of the viscosity of the material. And you can see that it's got this peculiar sort of um, quadratic shape. So what's happening is that at the low viscosity end, the material's behaving more or less like a fluid. And so in that situation, the heating rate depends on the viscosity. And so as you drop the viscosity, you get less and less dissipation. At this end, it's behaving more like an elastic solid. And what's happening is that as you make the viscosity larger and larger and larger, then the phase lag gets smaller and smaller, because a purely elastic body would have no phase lag. And so the dissipation drops. And in the middle, of course, you have this peak. And the peak happens at a particular point. And the way to understand it is that this is a so-called Maxwell viscoelastic model, which is the sort of simplest intermediate model you can get. And it's characterized by a Maxwell time, which is just the viscosity divided by the rigidity. So the Earth's mantle has a viscosity of 10 to the 21. The rigidity is 10 to the 11. And so the Maxwell time is 10 to the 10 seconds, or 300 years. So the Earth has a Maxwell time. And what happens is that if you arrange things so that the forcing period is the same as the Maxwell time, that's where you get your maximum dissipation. So this is right where the Maxwell time is equal to the forcing period. And so if we were forcing the Earth on a 300-year cycle, that would maximize the tidal heating. The problem, of course, is that real materials don't behave like Maxwell bodies. And so even though it's a very nice, conceptually simple model, real materials are more complicated than that. Nonetheless, the idea of there being a characteristic peak or at least a range of frequencies over which the heating is maximized, that's a good thing to hold in mind. And I think Carver has some examples in his poster showing this for different rheological models. Um, OK. so. The tidal heating rate depends on K2 on Q. That was the equation I just showed you. But K2 on Q depends on the heating rate. If we heat something up, the viscosity is going to change. And if the viscosity changes, so does the dissipation rate. And so you can get all kinds of feedbacks. And this is a plot from the, some of your required reading. And it's schematic, but it's showing the heat flux and the temperature. And the solid line is just the heating curve that you show, you've just seen, that the heating is maximized at some temperature that give, makes a Maxwell time equal to the forcing period. The green line 
is how you get heat out of the system. And this particular line is the melt, melt segregation curve. So if you're cold, you're not generating any melt. Once you cross the solidus, you start to generate melt, and you can, that melt can ascend to the surface and take heat out. And so now, as the temperature increases, the heat flux due to melting increases. But if you create too much melt, basically now you don't have a solid uh, matrix to move your melt through. And so the heat transport goes back down again. And something similar happens if you want to move the heat around by convection rather than by melting. But the crucial point is that there's only one stable equilibrium point at which you balance the heat produced with the heat removed. That's the only stable equilibrium. And so you might start over here, but at this temperature, the heat production outweighs the heat transfer. And so you move up this curve all the way to this equilibrium point. So there are feedbacks that are going to move you around in temperature space. It can get even more complicated, of course, because the heat production rate itself may change over time if the eccentricity changes. If the eccentricity changes, then the heat production rate drops at all temperatures. And so over the long term, if the eccentricity starts to evolve, this heating curve will move around too. So there are these quite complicated feedbacks between different parts of the tidal heating system. Something that I'm going to, not going to spend a lot of time talking about, but Isamu will, is that in liquid oceans, tidal heating may be important. And this is particularly true for obliquity tides, not for eccentricity tides. Um, one of my former students, Irina Chen, looked at this in some detail. And what she's plotting here is the log of the heat flux as a function uh, for different satellites. And the really important point is the pie charts show what kind of heating dominates. So blue is radiogenic, and green is eccentricity tides in the solid body, and then red is ocean tidal heating. And you can see that in this case, the only object for which obliquity tides in the ocean are important is Triton. That was for one assumed K2. You can do it for a different assumed K2. And you find the same thing, that only for Triton are obliquity tides likely to be important, possibly Tethys too. But in general, ocean tides don't affect the overall thermal evolution of these satellites. They're just too small. Something else that you can do with tides is to look for spatial heating patterns. Um, and where the heat is produced inside the body affects the distribution that you see on the surface. And so this is just a couple of plots from one of Carver's papers. If you get shallow heating, you get most of the heat coming out at the equator. If you have deep heating, you get most of the heat coming out of the poles. So this is very different. And so in principle, you can try and measure these and figure out which you're seeing. Ocean tidal heating does something different again. It produces more heat at the poles and less heat at the equator. And so it looks more like the deep heating model than the shallow heating model. So a pattern of heat flux is going to create other things that we might be able to measure. And one obvious possibility is topography. So you can imagine on an icy satellite, the shell thickness may vary. And that will give rise to topography that you can measure. You might also have kind of dynamic support, convective, convection cells. And so this is just an example. The top plot is from White et al. This is regional stereo topography of IO. And you can see, even though it's pretty noisy, there seems to be generally high topography here, low there, low there, and maybe high there. And then this is a plot of the spatial density of volcanoes on Io expanded up to, I think, degree six. But so there are surface observables that you can make that you can then compare with the theoretical predictions. And in this case, at least the volcano spatial density, it looks more like the shallow heating model than the deep heating model. Is the top plot you respect as shear? Um, no. This is res with respect to an ellipsoid. And so it's already had the the degree two stuff taken out. All right, where does all this energy come from? I mean, in the first instance, it comes from the satellite's orbit. 
that's really the, the, that's the first reservoir that you can extract heat from. And so what happens is that if you're generating heat through eccentricity tides, your orbit circularizes, at which point you don't get any more tidal heating. And similarly with obliquity tides, what happens is that the orbital inclination damps until you don't get any tidal heating. So in general, these processes are self-limiting. You can't keep extracting energy unless there's a resonance with a neighboring satellite. So a resonance is just the inner satellite is going around exactly twice or exactly three times as fast as the outer satellite. And the reason that's important is that that commensurability can increase the eccentricities to counteract these effects. And ultimately, in that case, where you're extracting the energy from is the spin of the primary. And that's an enormous reservoir, right? Saturn is massive, and it's spinning with a 10-hour period. And so that's an enormous source of energy if you can tap into it. And resonances allow you to do that. Um, I'm not going to go into any detail in this. Jim Fuller probably will. But you can end up with an equilibrium state in which the, the decrease in the eccentricity because of dissipation in the satellite is balanced by the increase in the eccentricity from the primary. And if that's the situation, then uh, the only thing that the tidal heating cares about is the Q of the primary. And so all your lack of knowledge about what's going on in the satellite becomes irrelevant. The amount of heat coming out of the satellite just depends on the Q of the primary, which is a nice simplification. So tidal heating goes as the eccentricity squared or the obliquity squared times by K2 on Q. And because K2 and Q depend on the internal structure, you can get these complicated feedbacks between the internal structure and the heating rate. Ocean tidal heating is usually negligible. If the satellite is isolated, both the eccentricity and the inclination will tend to damp. But in resonances, you can get much more complicated behavior. Thermal orbital evolution. So here we are again. Now we have, we're thinking about the primary being orbited by a satellite. And the primary will also experience a distortion. And there'll be some phase lag between the, uh, the bulge of the primary and the satellite. And so what will happen is that the primary will spin down and the satellite will move outwards. And the rate at which that happens will depend on the K2 and the phase lag of the primary. And the reason that this is interesting is because this is one very good way of establishing resonances, that in general, closer in things move out faster. And so that as they move out, they'll start to bump up against objects further out. And so this is just showing you a resonance. But the point, the reason that resonances are important is because those are the things that pump the eccentricity up. And so this is an example. Here I'm showing semi-major axis and time for the Saturnian satellites with a constant Q of Saturn. And so you can see that Mimas moves out rapidly. And Celadus doesn't move out so fast because it's tiny. But Tethys moves out. Dione moves out. And so as they move out, they may encounter various resonances with each other. But this is making a big assumption that the Q of Saturn is constant. And Valerie will presumably talk about this a lot. But that was for a Q of 16,000. The actual Q of Saturn is more like 2,000 which means that this time scale gets compressed by a factor of eight. So everything's happened really fast. Um, if Q is constant with time, but it may not be. And in particular, Jim Fuller has this nice resonance locking argument that I assume he'll talk about. And if you accept this, then that means that the Q has changed significantly over time. And what that allows you to do is to recover well-behaved satellite evolutions. They still evolve outwards. They still cross resonances. But they can have survived for billions of years with no problem. Then the other thing I wanted to mention is these feedbacks. That we've heard this before, but K2 on Q depends, uh, is affected by the internal structure. But the K2 on Q changes the orbital evolution, which also changes the internal structure. And so there's this feedback between what the orbit's doing and what the interior is doing. And this can lead to very complicated behavior, particularly when there are resonances. And so this is just one nice example from Hussman and Spohn. This is showing eccentricity as a function of time and heating rate as a function of time for Io and Europa and Ganymede. And you can see that there's this periodic behavior. 
that the eccentricities are going up and down and up and down, and the heating rate's going up and down and up and down. And some of these simulations, you even get a switch over where Europa starts looking like Io in terms of the dissipation, and Io cools down and starts not being dissipative. So you can get this very complicated behavior. Um, and this is nice because the, in this particular case, the, the oscillation period is comparable to the surface age of Europa, which is very young. 50 million years or so. All right, my last topic is how might we go about measuring the heat flow? And so there are basically two flavors. Um, the reason that we do this is because if we can measure the total power output, that gives us the K2 on Q that tells us something about the internal structure. And if we can measure the spatial distribution, that tells us about where the heat's being dissipated. So getting a measurement of tidal heat production or the variation in tidal heat production is potentially very useful. And in some cases, you can do this directly, right? At Enceladus, the heat is concentrated along the four uh, fractures near the South Pole called the tiger stripes. This is an infrared map. The tiger stripes are hotter than they should be. And so you can measure the amount of heat coming out of the inside of Enceladus. And then for Io, there's long-term infrared monitoring that allows you to try and estimate how much heat is coming out of the various volcanic centers over decades. So in some cases, you can make direct measurements. In other cases, you can't do that, but you can make indirect estimates. And so this hinges on the fact that the heat flow controls the temperature gradient. And so you go from cold ice to warm ice. And at some point, the ice gets so warm that it can't withstand any stresses. And so you end up with an elastic layer of ice. And the thickness of that elastic layer is controlled by the heat flux. And so what you can do is you can try and estimate how thick that elastic layer is. And that tells you what the temperature gradient is. That tells you how much heat is coming out. So this is an example at Tethys. Tethys has this nice rift running through the middle of it. And you can fit the, pro the flanks of this rift to an elastic profile. And you can derive an elastic thickness. And that allows you to get a heat flux when this rift was being formed. So it's a heat flux maybe a billion years ago. And then similarly at Enceladus, Enceladus has these craters which are clearly relaxed. It looks like the ice has flowed and filled them in. And that has to indicate that the ice is warm. And so again, it gives you some sense of what the temperature gradient is with depth. And in this case, the estimated heat flux is actually comparable to the amount of heat that's coming out of the south pole of Enceladus at the present day. So this is telling you that ancient Enceladus had heat fluxes comparable to the heat flux that we measure right now. So let me wrap up. I know that was a lot of stuff to get through. Material properties are frequency dependent. If you look at something at very long periods, it will respond in a different way to its behavior at short periods. K2 and H2 and L2 give you the amplitude. Q gives you the phase. And these all depend on the density structure and the rigidity structure. The satellite heating rate depends on K2 and Q, but it also depends on the eccentricity squared or the obliquity squared. And the heating rate, therefore, depends on the structure. The heating pattern also depends on the structure. And so if you can map the heat flux, then that tells you about where the heat's being produced. And if you don't have resonances, then heating damps the eccentricity, and it also damps the inclination. Satellites move away from the primary, and they move away at a rate that depends on what the Q of the primary is. And so that's one way of setting up resonances. But it also means that if you have resonances, you can get very complicated thermal orbital feedbacks, like those oscillation periods I showed you for Europa. And even if we can't measure the heat flux at the present day, we can use geophysics to infer what the heat flux was in the past. And so I think that is it. Let me see whether there are any other questions. Thank you.